Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're coming to you live right here from inside the main build facility at Bubba's Exotic Motorsports. I'm Tom. Wonderful weekend at the Supercar Saturday. We're going to be talking about that, and we all know the Master Bub entering stage right. Good morning, Bub. How are we doing today? So I was doing pretty good so far until I came over here and looked at this red cap on top of this pin of frost that's hidden behind the radiator. It's supposed to be in front <laughs> so you guys can see what the heck it is we're going to be talking about today. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you had a wonderful weekend as well. This episode is brought to you by Bubba's Exotic Motorsports. That's Bubba'sExoticMotorsports.com. We're going to be talking to you about a few of the big changes going on around here. We wanted to share with you, we've been promising a cooling system. We've had a lot of requests for this, bub. Before we jump into that, we had a great weekend with the whole crew down at the Exotics on Los Alas crew and the crew down at Broward Lamborghini, bub. Super weekend, man. Yeah, man, it was, uh, so this weekend, Saturday from 10 to 1 was the Supercar Saturdays of Florida. If you guys missed any of that and you maybe aren't local, you didn't yeah. get to see it, go to Instagram.com forward slash Supercar Saturdays Florida. You can pull that up. You can also pull up Floyd Rags Instagram page and you will see crazy videos, GoPro shots, guys racing on the yeah. streets, the crowd, so cool, the man. music, so cool, everything man. that was going on there. Super great time. Uh, but that was at Lamborghini of Broward. That's about an hour south of us. So it's a super fun cruise from here in Jupiter down to Lamborghini Broward. It is maybe 45, 50 miles. So you are cruising about 100. It makes it a lot of fun. Get it these was. high end rides out there and just get them opened up on the highway a little bit and uh, had some fun with it. You were driving the BEM SEMA Mustang down there, bub. You had the beautiful Layla Von Athey, Miss Outlaw herself and her wonderful mother, Robin, riding in the BEM 991. Yep. And I followed in the 981. It's kind of cool, bub, on our way down about halfway there. It takes us about an hour to get there. We noticed there was a red Viper hanging kind of in the middle lane, not going too, <laughs> fast. Not going too fast. I backed up a little bit because you and Layla and uh, Robin and I drive those cars very tight together because we know each other's driving driving style so well, and we let this gentleman in. Uh, he went all the way down there with us and snuggled up. It was a great time, man. Well, you know, listen, and it's so probably one of the, and you know, it's funny because a lot of people don't really talk Vipers anymore. There's still a, a huge Viper following. You're coming on a good point here. Um, but they're really, they've turned into more of a cherished collector car than yeah, they have yeah. And every day, like, oh, there's an Audi R8, or oh, there's a Lamborghini Huracan, or oh, um, there's a 57 Bel Air, or sure. oh, there's a 69 Camaro, right? Like, that is not that kind of car. Right, right. Um, the Vipers are out there, but they're more of like a collector item. Like, now it is, it's a thing to say you yep. have a Viper, where that was, you know, a couple years back, you know, like mid 2000s. Um, you know, when those cars are really bumping pretty hard and all the guys that had, you know, that six figure ballpark range, they could go and just buy one. So there was a time where they were hot. Yep. Now they've turned into that more of a collector car where you don't see them on every corner or every event. And it's funny, too. We just, you know, we knew that this gentleman was going that way. He followed us all the way into the event. Uh, we, of course, had Monster Energy out there with us. I need to call Shane and the uh, Monster Girls. They see how they liked it. Uh, I know they were posting pictures. Did you see they had uh, the Monster Energy uh, truck parked right next to the BEM cars? Yeah. And people were sitting with the BEM cars taking Monster Energy picks, putting them up. Yeah, you know, it, uh, it was a super cool event, man. It's, uh, it was, man. you know, I was really concerned that he was he was going to try to race me in that Viper because I really didn't want to have to show him that up in that four cylinder <laughs> turbo Mustang. <laughs> I mean, that just would have been like, uh. It wound up, too. He owns a very prominent jewelry business he's a doctor knows all about our work and what's funny bub is you know you never know who you're going to run into in life he had several pe separate people driving his brand new mercedes gt down there as well yeah you know it's uh it's cool because it's one of the hashtags that's actually you know hashtag meaning in today's social media world um a hashtag is just kind of like a quick little combo of words you throw together whether it's a phrase sure. whether it's kind of like a you know an action or whatever yep. the heck it may yep. be and they are endless you can come up with whatever the heck you want um but one of the hashtags that you always see associated with Supercar Saturdays Florida is hashtag you never know. You never know. Because you never know who you is don't. going to be there. There were yeah. a few of the Miami Dolphins players were there. Floyd yes. introduced me to, so there's a lot of oh, great guys. Oh, he did? Out, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, so a lot of great guys Active out there. Active players were on the around. roster? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right on, man. So really cool stuff, man. Um, a lot of great people out there. You never know who you're going to run into, what kind of rides you're going to see, everything from old to new. I'll tell you what, man, there was a lot of. 70s 80s bmws yeah. that were really taking over like that and this is another one of them hashtag stance nation right so yeah. Yeah. where they're all on air ride they're running serious camera on the wheels but they're all laid down on the ground tucking the rims all the way up in there 
it's a lot of that stuff there, man, and there's a huge following for it coming on right now. You know what I also noticed there, bub? There's, of course, there's all the Porsches and the Ferraris and the uh, Lamborghinis and all of that. The, the, I mean, when you stand by that Aventador, that Huracan, it just, it's just, your mind, it, it's an overload. You can't get enough of the lines, but what I saw were a lot of the, the Dodge Hellcats uh, uh, showing up. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> That was one of those cars that uh, you know, especially the new Dodge Demons, right? So the Demons. You've yes. got to get you've got to get your name on a list to get a Demon ordered up. But for the Hellcats, for example, those were a car that uh, you know there was the SRT8, and then from there there was you know, and Dodge has always done a great job of giving you options. There's like the Daytona, they then have, they have yes. the Bumblebee, and then they had, you know they've always had like all these different model names of, and it really came down to your packages you were getting in terms of like looks, you know, whether it be you know outside bumper graphics, whatever it may be. Um, but most of those things were pretty much powered the same setup. Now, the Hellcats, for example, were the 6.4 Hemi, but they were factory supercharged, not just a base, naturally aspirated motor like you would get in like a Dodge Charger SRT. So it was, you know, each model line gave you a little something different. The Hellcats coming in right at like 68 to 70. Incredible um, what they're doing with those cars. Bro. Yeah, you know, they're, they're pulling a strong, strong following. There's a lot of people buying them up right now. It's a great car for the money you put into it. Um, you probably, it's one of those cars where it's an all around like, good bang for your buck the car is itself um but you just you know it, it, to me that car hasn't changed the challenger for example oh the body style you has saying. not changed since 2007 we're 11 years into that body and it hasn't wow. changed a single thing that's right you did the first 2009 uh, 70s Challenger refit didn't you yeah yeah you did for the Andreatis brothers yeah so it's uh you know f for me it's hard to go and spend that kind of money when it's not new so you're it. buying a new car, but it's still the exact same but thing as a, a 2007. But from a perspective, what would you change? Because kind of it was throwing it back to those old... Well, it's, it's even changing the smallest thing. They haven't changed anything. They haven't changed Got the front it. bumper design, the headlight design, the tail. Nothing's changed. Um, small pieces on the interior have changed. You know, the cockpit's turned a little bit more towards you on, you know, in terms of like the center console media uh, station, kind of like the, like the originals cars. were. Yeah. Um, so they changed a little bit there, but they, they haven't done anything major or drastic to the body. Um, so to me, it's like, you know, everybody looks at it differently, but would you go and buy a 2018 for 70, 80 grand, um, north of that, if you're getting a demon yeah. or just go buy a used 2007, 2008 for 10 grand and put 30 and upgrades and into it, it yeah. and build it exactly the way you want, whether you want to go wide body, whether you want to go full carbon on the front end, you know, whatever it is you may want to do. Um, it's, it's kind of like one of those things, you know, when I like to buy, buy something, I want to buy it new because That's it's right, like the do. hottest, like it's the newest release. Yep. Um, I just wouldn't go and spend premium dollars on a car that looks like it's looked for 15 years. It's, it's going to be an amazing event. We have an event coming up we'll be talking about at some point on September 19th. Uh, the doctor invited us to. Um, so we'll be doing that. We have Exotics on Los Alas coming up. We have Supercar Saturday in September coming up. A lot going on, Bob. Yeah. A lot going on. But we're going to jump into cooling systems. We've had a lot of questions asked. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you he is in the top three for a reason. I literally have to write notes to understand this stuff. So uh, we're going to go through this uh, and why cooling systems are so very important. This is stuff, it is often said uh, around the industry that Bub will forget more in 30 minutes than most people will know in a lifetime. That's not arrogant. It's just that's what he knows and that's what he walks around into. But an overall description of a cooling system is something that keeps the temperatures on the engine down yeah it's uh you know it's not to keep them freezing cold um it's to maintain it's to maintain and that? regulate a specific temperature but why is it why is it you don't want it because i i remember back in the 60s <laughs> if something was running hot of course we've all learned from you that carburation is what causes things to run hot 90 mm -hmm. percent of the time the idea was pull the cool the thermostat out and don't even worry yeah, that's, about it that's that old school never been myth busted uh you know guess here and there rat router style deal um you know and we can get into that too and that's part of what we were going to talk about with cooling is um engine temps right so engine so temps, why is this important it's in my notes to talk to you about well it's it's to maintain and regulate a certain temperature the human body has a body temperature it operates best yes. at right and two or three Correct. degrees in a body could right real fast um so when you're working with engines for example there are certain things that come into effect start off with the basics engine temps in terms of what the motor is made out of what what its material is the cast cast has a certain point that it can only handle to gaskets they can only handle to a certain degree ah, temperature yes. um, your air fuel delivery system is going to make a huge effect onto your cooling system and the, what that engine is doing in terms of temps as well uh, but everything literally comes down to 
a specific range that that motor needs to operate in, 10, 20 degree range, depending on what your setup is, and uh, you know what kind of what kind of running and driving you're doing with that application. Does heat though? Uh, does heat help produce horsepower, Bob? So yeah, I mean, there's actually a um, too hot is going to give you a negative effect. There is a specific operating range that you want to be in. Um, today's now. old school guys used to think of things as. Read my notes, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if they can read it. I don't know. I don't know if the clarity's there. You will see that Bub is hitting on exactly what I wanted to question him about. Bub, how much time did you know about prep preparing for this show? How much did you have? Zero. <laughs> so did you know any of these questions? I actually just finished posting up on our website the new Audi RS7 Capristo Sorry. exhaust. So <laughs> that was like, if you look at the time difference, that's where I went from Audi on our website to out here with cooling systems. So heat from an engine can generate horsepower, but at the same time, it can be detrimental to an engine? Yeah, big time. It's, uh, you know, and that's that's one of the things that most people don't understand is there was an, and, and, you know, let's throw old school stuff in here because this could go on for hours. Um, a lot of myths are involved in cooling systems and engine temperatures. A lot of myths. Um, there are certain things that, uh, you know, a lot of people just don't understand about cooling systems and or they don't understand about ignition air fuel systems, which the two have to work hand in hand. Um, regardless of how your motor's built, brand new, whether it's custom build, whether it's a crate engine, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, so we want to touch on all that real quick for you guys and not go too crazy overboard, but keep it still very understandable. Um, cooling systems are meant to regulate temperatures and they are meant to hold at a certain degree. And that is based on what the engine is going to operate most efficiently at. Some guys used to think that pulling out thermostats and trying to get the thing to run 140 degrees is gonna be uh, the best power. Okay, yeah, so a motor that is cooler is going to perform really strong, but are you ever going to be able to reliably maintain 140 degree engine temps? Absolutely not. Get it out of your head, it's never gonna happen. Most Even engines, on today's vehicles? Yeah, most engines, once they are up there and today's vehicles getting higher than they have ever been, um, are normally north of that 200, 220 degree mark for a normal operating temperature where most guys, for example, 62 Corvettes, they would be pulling over on the side of the road if they were above 210. The cars would be spitting out cooling everywhere, they because would be boiling over. It's, you were telling us gaskets and cast iron can only handle so much. Right, right. Water boils at 212 degrees. Yeah, 212, it was water straight. Straight water boils at 212. Right. Now we do, Bob, let's talk about now, one of the things we'll learn from you is when you pressurize a system, mm -hmm. you're able to raise that boiling point. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Now, if you add glycol, ethylene glycol, mm -hmm. or... Antifreeze. Antifreeze, ladies and gentlemen. And ethylene glycol cannot be detoxified. Be very, very careful around humans and animals. Don't change your coolant on the side uh, uh, on the side of your driveway and leave it laying around. Don't, don't, don't. It cannot be detoxified. Ethylene glycol, so if we add 15 pounds here, bub, to, mm -hmm. to the cap, okay, mm -hmm. and we add ethylene glycol, what do we do? We're raising our boiling temperature by to 285 degrees. Yes, yeah, so you're going to raise that boiling point. Um, and what that's going to do is allow you to, again, perform and let the engine and cooling system maintain, say, for example, a 220 degree, 200 Corvettes. Fans turn on factory on Corvettes at 226 nowadays. So that's a lot higher that's than the That's over old the boiling point. That's way over the boiling point. And naturally that's 46 degrees hotter than what most guys used to try to achieve in keeping engine temps at 180. So that's a pretty big difference. And that was, you know, that was like a go-to, uh, that was a pretty good number. You know, I can pretty much tune cars to maintain about a 180 to yes. 190 range. Um, but again, I just told you I can tune cars to maintain that. That had nothing to do with the cooling system right there. I was totally on a different level talking about being able to tune a car to maintain a 180 to 195 so range. So what is that difference then? So that's actually in, and, and this is where we have to start with cooling systems. When these things are built from manufacturers, Here and this comes, is key, like, we gentlemen. need to start at the starting because a lot, of so people, a lot of people get off track and they dick this thing up really bad just by doing little mods here, mods so there, changing. Um, cooling systems all the way back to the early 1900s, and I'm talking early 1900s, we're designed to work, right? So if you have something that is not working, you probably just have nothing more than a simple part failure somewhere along the way. Now that could be major, it could be little, it could be head gasket, it could be thermostat, um, it could be your mixture of antifreeze to water, 50-50 ratio. But it is ratio. coolant related. Yeah, so a lot of people don't understand that. They think that they've got a 62 Corvette and it just started overheating or running hot. 
let's pull the thermostat out of the thing. Absolutely not. You're going to ask for more trouble because one key factor that most people don't understand is thermostats are meant to, like I continue to say, regulate flow. They are not meant to open up and stay wide open. They are meant to open up, allow cool fluid from your radiator that's been sitting here getting cooled by airflow coming across yes. the front, whether it be by electric fan or manual fan pulling from the front side of the motor. Any coolant that's in the radiator, when that thermostat is shut, is cooling down inside of the radiator. It's not heating up in here, it heats up in the block. Here it comes. So when that thermostat hits a certain degree, the, the fluid inside the motor hits 200 degrees, Opens. 180, 195, 160, whatever it may be, that thermostat's gonna open, allow this fluid that's cooling down, lower, in, lower temps here than are in the motor, it's going to circulate through. The hot fluid will now be inside your radiator. The cold fluid will be at the thermostat. The thermostat will then be forced to shut because it's below its operating range on the colder fluid that's been sitting here. And then it's going to continually allow it to maintain a certain temperature off of that thermostat. 180, 160, 195, 205, 215. Now here's the problem. Most people think that they are going to put in a 160 thermostat and it's gonna maintain. 99% chance it will not. A 160 thermostat will almost always stay open all the time. So Bub, let's get to this because you're hitting right on it. Another one of the things I wanted to ask you about, I kid you not, ladies and gentlemen, it's written right here, flow rates. And Bub has just hit on flow rates. There was a time, Bub, when the original designers, it was believed that the slower the, th the flow rate, the better, because it would allow the veins in the radiator, the veins being these areas inside of here, to cool down. That's a myth. Mm -hmm. It is the faster, the better. Yeah. So, so, go ahead. So you have, and again, starting with key number one, cooling systems, if you are working with a mass production vehicle, do not dick with it. If it is working like it should, leave it exactly as it is. There are a lot of guys out there that, and even in today's modern society, modern world, modern performance, um, challengers, we talked about those a little bit at the starting, um, Corvettes, Camaros, Vipers, whatever it may be, you can buy, for example, like a Mishimoto polished radiator. There is probably going to be absolutely zero difference in the design and structure of the radiator. It will just be a fully polished design versus a plastic factory style one, more of a show style piece than it would be something that's stock, right? Okay. So for example, you're getting a radiator, you wanna do an upgrade to your car, you're not necessarily changing anything about that cooling system, you're just gonna get the added looks of a fully polished radiator that's got nice end caps on it, nice top plates on it, so it looks really good. But it's still dealing with flow rates. It still, still needs dealing to move with flow at rates. a certain rate yep. for the coolant to, re to, to stay within the range that the manufacturer originally developed it, or when you're doing a mm -hmm. build, you're originally developing that engine to. Right. For example, tomorrow morning you have a car that's coming in, uh, it's a Camaro, 2011 Camaro, I yep. think? Yep. Yep. Supercharged Camaro. Yep. It was built locally here. Uh, they, the thing just keeps falling on its face when it's under power at 4,000 to 4,500 RPMs. I can't answer the question on the phone, okay? Mm -hmm. But when you're designing something like that, you have to take into account how that motor is going to run from a temperature basis. Yeah. It has to be into account, right? Yeah, but you know, and that's that kind of leads you into, and again, for something like that, that's a forced induction application. So you had a 2011 Camaro that started off rolling out of GM's factory mass production assembly plant. Everything worked, worked to the T. So now when you've taken a car, and, and this I'm just trying to be as basic as I can. So if you've taken a car that was 100% stock, did exactly what it should do with no overheating problems whatsoever, but then you pull it and put on a supercharger, an aftermarket upgrade. There is your aftermarket added component. What has that changed? So that naturally has changed your air and fuel delivery system, which is going to change what the motor is doing in terms of its engine temps because of the way it ignites. So fuel inside of the cylinders plus spark, that is going to change your engine temps, which if you don't do anything else either externally to your cooling system to match that mod, or if you've done an improper tune, that's where you're going to get raised engine temps. Because we've learned, Bub, that just like carburetors, even EFI systems that are not yep. char uh, tuned properly, it's like taking a uh, charcoal starter and dumping it on your barbecue right. at home. But one, I'm going to identify a few of the pieces of the system here. Can you tell everybody, this is an older piece, a lot yep. of it's done electronically now, but could you tell me please what is this I have in my hand? So this unit that you're holding here is actually an electronic temp sensor and what this does is the top side is your connecting post. It is fully isolated through the center so that it is not grounding out in terms of the outside mounting position and the threads. And then the bottom side is the actual sending unit that picks up and operates a cooling temperature. So it tells you if your motor is 100 degrees, 200 degrees, 165. It will tell you everything in between 
99.9% accurate on today's electronic cooling sensors. Is this what you use, Bub, to electrically turn fans on and off with? Yeah, so typically you use two of them. Um, today's cars are running mostly on two. You have one that typically powers your gauge, and you have a separate that powers a fan system, a cooling fan system. That way there are no interruptions or disconnects between the two. Bub, what do I hold in my hand right here? So that is just a traditional radiator hose. You're going to find these all the way back to the early 1900s, maybe before that, and still being used all the way up to today's vehicles. Today we have an upper and a lower radiator yep. hose on our cars, one that hooks to the water pump itself and one that hooks to the radiator. Both dial into the radiator, correct? Yeah, both are going to go into the radiator. Sometimes you have Ys off of those if it's a sealed radiator where you do not have a fill access access or a check valve, they will have a sealed radiator assembly um, and then you will fill through a separate tank, whether it be a plastic molded container uh, with a cap on the side or if you have some sort of standalone reservoir that you fill through. And Bub, what, what do we have right here? So traditional right here is just basic hose clamps. These are worm gear clamps so they tighten down as you actually adjust and put more tension on them as needed to clamp down the hose around its fitting. The reason they call worm gear, Bub's saying worm gear, is as you turn this screw right here, there is a gear type assembly inside of here that contacts these slots and pulls it tighter and looser. So these have to be tight, Bub, for everything to work. Bub, I'm gonna hold this up to the camera. Would you please tell everybody what this part is right here? So this is super, super vintage. This belongs in a museum, this piece does. <laughs> oh, there's a boat anchor. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, I painted this this morning so it looked good. So this is from a mid-1900s vehicle that we had here at the facility we were doing a restoration on. So this is a very old product. Uh, you are looking at the backside of a water pump with main pulley and also the fan assembly on the front. The way that unit works is very, very simple. There's an impeller inside of the casting that is painted blue. There is nothing more than just a steel impeller and a gasket that seals that up. As the belt on the front of this spins, which hooks up to your crankshaft and also other accessories if, have, if you have them, this fan spins, which not only does two jobs, it makes that water pump spin, which inside that impeller is moving fluid through the engine, the coolant, but it also uses the fan blades to pull air across the front of the motor and air through the radiator. So, Bob, this is the water pump. This is where it all starts. Yep. And the fan connects right here, and as it spins, that's what drew air across the motor. Yeah, this super, is super heavy, dangerous. Yeah, very um, dangerous. Really heavy, cast iron, very heavy material there. Uh, today's water pumps may be less than a half a pound. Um, in terms of the fact that they're also fully aluminum. O-ring style seal, this one is totally different than that. Um, these, these systems are, they're old, man. They're, that thing right there is probably north of 40 pounds. It is. Um, with the water pump, the pulley, and the fan, and they're dangerous. As you can see, there is no shroud around that fan. There are a lot of people in the entire world over the years that have had their arms ripped open by fan blades, lost hands, lost fingers. Yep. Super, super dangerous to work with, which leads you into, again, today's technology. Electronic fans, less weight, full power and they're fully shrouded it is just that simple they're safe they're efficient they do exactly what they should do and they cool 100 times more than any sort of factory water pump mounted fan would so here bub is an example of what you're talking about an electric fan yep. this is hooked into the ecm or electronic control module mm -hmm. it ties into it what causes this to work so that would be told to turn on and off this is very simple basic setup this is a power and ground fan one power wire, one ground wire. The ground is simple, the power goes to a relay source, very simply set up, and then the relay needs to be told when to turn on and turn off, and that is simply done by a coolant sensor that knows when it should activate. Typically, what I build with uh, a universal system or doing cooling fan setups, I typically run in a 185 on, 170 off on my fans, and I match that to a 180 degree thermostat, and let me tell you, the cooling system is dead on efficient. And we can see, ladies and gentlemen, your fingers are shrouded, even small fingers for kids. If somebody tries to get their yep. hand in here, the blades are pushed forward. They're very, very technologically thought out. They're very, very reliable, and they're very safety oriented. A lot of people will say the product liability, uh, the liability lawyers uh, develop everything today. Well, there's something to be said for that. Also look at the size of this fan, Bub, compared to the size of this old steel fan right here. It's one third of the size. Yeah, much compared. smaller and, uh, you know, it's incredible how something smaller, and again, this is, you're working with two of the best components here. Uh, this radiator is by a company called Be Cool. So in the universal auto world, this is probably one of the top brands out there. Uh, but you pay a lot of money for that, man. This is uh, this radiator right here is just north of 600 bucks, and it's just a piece of aluminum. It is that expensive for something so basic. They do have a fully polished show shine quality. Those are typically three times the price. So you're looking in the $1,600, $1,700 range. 
for a radiator that just keeps your coolant system down. And Bob, one of the things we've learned today probably that's most important is EFI systems aren't, aren't subject to running hot like the old carbureted systems. These were very popular in the carbureted systems where people were trying to find solutions to their overheating problem when they really didn't need to look any further than the carburetor itself. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know that was a big issue, man. It's uh, especially too on Corvettes. Um, Corvettes always had a problem with hot engine temps and uh, you know, a lot of people never really understood that. A lot of guys thought that, you know, dead center, I think, in the gauge of a, of a cooling system on a VET is 220, if, I, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, and a lot of people thought, and that's dead in the middle. So it's like 160, 220, and Pegged. 260, right? Is yep. that right? So yep. what is that? That's a, I want to say it's somewhere around there, right? Yep. Um, a lot of people thought that when it was hitting that dead center mark that it was overheating, and it's that's that's far from correct. So these cars naturally ran, ran hot. in that 195 thermostat range, which typically allowed them to get up to the 205, 210 before that cooling system correct. would start bringing its temperatures back down again. So that's why a lot of guys saw that needle approaching the 210, 220 mark, but totally normal, man. You're not going to blow a head gasket in that range. The cast motors can handle it. The basic gaskets can handle it. Um, and a lot of people had some big misconception with that because you get a bunch of guys sitting around at car shows talking about, oh, I got this Be Cool radiator, it's down to 180 now. Yes, all of that can come down if you spend that much time doing upgrades, but if you're sitting in an operating range that's efficient for your setup, there's no reason to go and modify it and change it because then you might get outside of where you wanna be. Some guys put in colder spark plugs, hotter spark plugs, advance the timing, you know, people start jumping all that. around, and before you know it, you've probably messed with 10 different variables. And you've got it running worse than ever before. And then every time you shut the car off at a car show, Doesn't it just start. sits and spits and spits, cooling out of it, and the thing's hot, the starter won't turn over because the of how hot it is. Into, oh. uh, the intake, and it won't oh, yeah. start again. Oh yeah. But there's, uh, I wanna cover one thing. I knew that this is gonna be a long segment. Uh, it, it, there's so much to this, but from a design standpoint, I wanted people to understand what you're thinking about when you're, before you even put a piece of paper to the the pencil and pa paper and pencil together before you build a motor. These are the things that have to go into yeah. everything you do. Bob, we've got a couple different types of antifreeze here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to slide this aside. I see Mercedes Benz, I see Penafrost, and I see standard antifreeze here. Just add water. What is the difference between a 50-50 cut and a standard antifreeze? Uh, what, you're pa what you're paying for. So here's what you're getting. So you're literally, if you, for example, is this 50-50 or is this straight? Straight. Okay. So this would be straight right here. So this is a straight ethylene glycol. This is green. Um, I don't know if this one will work with multi-vehicles. Probably will. All makes and models. All, okay. So all makes and models. So that is what's um, pretty particular in today's world of cooling systems. So especially when you get into like the Euro car market, you are working with something that didn't just used to be what most people thought like, hey, my car says the coolant lights on or maybe it just spit some out. Let me stop at a gas station and get some green antifreeze and pour it in. You cannot do that anymore. And it's a shame. You literally have specific coolant for different manufacturers. Go, and and that is key because some coolants cannot mix together. They will literally create a gel form. They create a gel. Um, and you could literally destroy your entire engine and every piece along the way that that coolant runs through. So heater core, bypass valves, radiator, mm. water pump, hoses, every last piece of it. Could be taken Because out. you didn't take the time to figure out which $10 bottle of coolant to buy for your ride. So Bub, make sure that we're using, when in doubt, use the all makes and models, correct? Yeah, it's, uh, you can use an all makes and models. Um, you know, they're the most universal and me, naturally, you know that I'm not going to go that way, but in a, in a in a immediate emergency situation, all makes and models, antifreeze will work pretty much with every one of your systems. I would naturally want to get the right stuff in there all the time. Uh, one other question, Bob. Well, two questions uh, to go behind that. Number one, I think, um, do you, you would you, if you were in an emergency situation, use, or a situation where you needed to add to coolant, um, would you use the cut or the straight? Um, so naturally, I would buy a, a cut, a pre-mix. So the, yeah, average retail person use cut. That's I correct. would, yeah, <laughs> on a mass production level where you have access to you know the proper measuring devices and you take the time you're doing it with the right set of skills. It is of course cheaper to buy a bottle, a one gallon thing of straight. So meaning this is 100% antifreeze, no water mix at all. It's cheaper to buy it this way because then you're not paying for a 50-50 mix of just water. normal water. Um, but what you do want to do, and that is very key with cooling systems, again, is make sure it is 50-50 mixture, 100% key. And that is the way everybody does them all the way back to the early 1900s, all the way through to today. It has to be pre-mixed 50-50, even when you are working with companies such as Mercedes-Benz, when you're working with Porsche, Lamborghini, all of them are still on a 50-50 mix basis. That is the way it has always been. It's never going to change. 
and you want to make sure that you're buying the proper coolant to put in with that mix. In other words, Pinafrost is typically a European brand. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so Pinafrost. This one was out of a. Uh, this was out of a. Uh, actually, no. This was for Mercedes. Mopar. This was Mopar. This was Mercedes, and this is just a universal. The universal one. Yep. So that's kind of an overview then on cooling systems. Is there anything else you'd like to add uh, to to the viewer and to say you know tips, advice, anything like that? You know, it's, uh, I think one of the things that I would suggest is if you are having trouble with your engine temps, maybe you think they're higher than they should be, number one, I would do your research. What should that engine be operating at, especially if it is a stock-based vehicle? Um, most vehicles are going to operate exactly where they should unless something has failed, and it's just that simple. Maybe you haven't done a coolant flush in a very long time. You've got some restriction. How often do you suggest that is being done? You know, man, that's so crazy that, uh, you know, you could ask that question. It could be 50,000 miles, 75, it could be 100,000 miles on coolant. It's just as simple as taking the cap off when it's cold and looking at the condition of the coolant. You can even have it coolant tested, and you can have condition tests done to see, and that's just nothing more than a strip you stick in and check it out just like you check a fish tank water. Fish tank. Bob, I want to touch real quick while you're on this there are new waterless uh, evans makes a uh, i'm sorry uh, yes a waterless uh, coolant um, which you're aware of of course you stay on top of all this stuff those waterless coolants do not allow vapor burning uh, they go up to 300 and some degrees in their overheating and 40 degrees below zero yeah. and because they are waterless if they go down into that side of it uh it the the, it, the antifreeze when it freezes contracts it doesn't expand and turn into ice yeah what's the advantage of that to the motor so it's great man because you're not having to worry about things that again years back um you know there were a lot of guys with older vehicles you'd have freeze plugs on them that would pop out in the winter time freeze plugs um you know and then before you could even start that car up and drive it again you've got to immediately address that issue and most of the time that's not a small issue Freeze you plugs know. were designed, Bub, to keep the block from cracking. Right. As you know, mm -hmm. uh, there are little buttons that push out. They're about, how big are they? Two inches in diameter? Yeah, inch? two inch, roughly. Yeah, two inches in yeah, diameter. They, I mean, they change from an inch and a half to, you know, two and a half inches, depending on what you're working on. And if the water was to freeze in the block, it would push those out, yep. as opposed, and this is why, as Bub said, run a 50-50 cut, not just water, because it will freeze. The waterless uh, uh, applications today are very good about that not happening. Much higher boiling points, much lower freezing points as well though. So we've got two comments we need to address here. Okay. Number one, let me start off with the fact that I just looked at myself down here on my phone. Uh, my face and up top is very red in the screen and trust me, that is how red I am right now. I did get severely burnt yesterday. Yeah, you went down to, uh, you were out with the uh, amazing Layla Von Ethi yesterday. Well, you were all Saturday at the uh, supercar show as well. Yeah, so we'll start with that one in case you guys are wondering why I look like a cherry pepper up top. Uh, the next thing would be morning to Nate. He's watching. Also, oh, Chris Bollinger. He says that I think the Chrysler 300 is basically unchanged for 20 years. True statement, man. It, well, uh, is that true, though, uh, Chris? Because very slight they, changes. Yeah, but you know what, Bob? They Chrysler really had well. Chrysler really had something with uh, the letter car when they brought it out. It looked like but the Bentley. think about think about a 1966 Chrysler 300 versus a 2007 Chrysler 300. The like designers were changing them up all the there's time. There's no similarities at all whatsoever. Now, I will say to, so Chris, I do agree to that, um, that they haven't really changed that too much. Aesthetics-wise, they've changed them a little bit. Um, but those things, you know, as you know, those were running Mercedes W215 rears. They were great rear ends oh, of those were cars. They really? Yeah, independent rear suspension. Um, that car for, I think for a luxury vehicle, especially today, because now they're coming pretty solid loaded, um, for a luxury vehicle with just over 400 horsepower, they gave you a lot of fun potential, right? So you had a car that is now, especially if you go buy one today, 40, 50 grand, um, pretty conservative on price. It's about normal for, for a four-door luxury. Um, they've got, to me, you know, decent styling lines to them. They've got more of a classy style to them than they do a sporty style. They don't have the sport look to them like the Charger or the Challenger yep. does. Um, so they've got more of that rounded look to them, but, uh, you know, all modern, man, all LED, everything, full active headlight systems on them now, um, you know, the navigation, I mean, all the way down to the valve exhaust system on those cars. So it does have all of the performance things you would want, but now all of the luxury styling. It's funny too, Bob, because I look at that from a design standpoint, because I try to think often from what you're seeing. And uh, the newer ones, to me, just don't have that Bentley-esque look so that you can do that much with. No, you know, there was uh, the mid-2000s ones. They really, they really came out with some options, man. And those cars looked really good if you hey, stanced them down a little bit, tended the windows, and just did like tw a 22, 24 stagger wheel and tire combo on them. And that's a big rim to shove under that car. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of people took the, uh, the SRT10, the Dodge, the Viper Ram trucks, right? You remember those were Viper-powered yep, sure with the do. V10s. 
um, a lot of guys would take the Ram SRT 10 wheels and put them on to on okay. the 300s. And let me tell you, if you haven't seen that, just go Google a 300 with SRT 10 wheels and it looks, looks insane. Does yeah, it? yeah, super, super good, man. Just a factory Mopar setup, looks really good. You drop them down an inch and a quarter and they're just, there they're is, tucked man. right there. And I mean, that's it, like that's a clean rider that's for an it. everyday ride. I often think about that because I know you, we like to valet our cars and look nice, especially when we're invited to events and it, it's all about how you pull up. And I think about from a design standpoint, when I see a car, what would you be doing in your mind? Uh, and I've thought about that car often, Chris, so that's very good. I often try to put myself in Bub's shoes and think from his position, you know. So I always discounted the newer 300s, um, kind of like you are, because I didn't think it had enough capabilities to style and be upgraded from a class standpoint, like I'm accustomed to Bub having. So Mark Hoffman's loving the vet, by the way. Good morning to the BEM dirt track driver, Mr. Mark Hoffman. He was out for two weeks, Bub. Uh, he is back. Uh, we were not on the air this Saturday because we were at the Supercar Saturday event. We'll return live this Saturday with the race rider report. Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of the points that Mark made was a good point about cooling systems and how they are so specific, right, in terms of your fluids and what yep. you're putting in. And he compared it to, it's comparable to transmission fluids. Yes. Dead on. And like it doesn't get any more specific than that and it is mark honestly as small as just a simple spec that most people screw up their rides in today's world mark's technical like you are he yeah yeah it's it's simple man it's uh most cars you pull out a dipstick a lot of cars unfortunately today are starting to do away with dipsticks which does suck it does make them more of a dealership style service system on these things um, or electronics in terms of leveling and conditioning and checking and flushes. Man, the, the Jeeps, the mid-2000 Jeeps, you cannot flush them at all. You cannot check them at all. You literally have to put them on a machine and go through an access hole in the bottom center of the pan to flush, fill, add, check, everything, which is dealer only. Um, so there are a lot of specifics to it, but as simple as you're about to spend six bucks to buy a quart of transmission fluid, um, average quarts are probably, you have 12 to 15 quarts of transmission fluid in there. So the numbers add up pretty quick. You yep. get up to, you go from six and bucks to 150, 200 real fast, you know, just in fluids alone. And that's just doing basic fluids. That's not doing, you know, fully synthetics or, you know, the upgraded higher end scale. How about the electricity to run the flush machine? Right. Um, but How about it's, the money to take, you have to dispose with, in a hazardous materials manner. It costs us 30 bucks yeah, to have to it picked up. Yeah. Um, so it is all down to specifics, man. It's, uh, if, if you don't know what you should be running and your fluids are low, thankfully you've taken the time to check your fluids, right? That's step number one is checking the fluids. If you find out that they are low, it's as simple as getting exactly what should be in there because one quart of the wrong could contaminate all 15 of the That's right. Correct. So you want to take the time, you want to find out what those specs should be. Typically, we never mess around when it comes to any of the fluids. Right. If you don't know what's in there, maybe somebody's modded it over the get years. Get rid of all of it. Get rid of all of it and start over so you know that it's dead on accurate where it is and let it rip for another 50,000 yep. miles if that's what it's going to be. But that's, Bob, one of the things you're very careful about is, especially with transmissions, if you change trans fluid, and what's in there is black, you'll back away from it altogether. Why yeah, is that? Yeah, typically if, uh, you know, you that's a condition check, you know, so it's not just being low on fluid, but that's just naturally checking the fluid and levels and seeing what it's doing. Maybe the trance is giving you symptoms of slipping a little bit yep. or full throttle, um, but you pull that dipstick out and you can actually smell uh, a very you know, strong burnt smell. Burnt smell. Um, Transmission fluid has a distinct smell as it yep. is, and if you don't know how to compare, you can grab a brand new bottle of transmission fluid and smell it, compare it to that's correct. what's in your good vehicle, point. right? Yeah. Very simple to see what's good, what's bad. Um, but if you are working with something that's black, that's burnt, that's dark brown, um, don't change probably it. not don't best change off it. to change it because that means something inside that trans is burnt. And a lot of the time, and it sounds crappy, but a lot of the time, that burnt fluid has a lot of metallic flake in there from the clutches that have burned. So that's really what's holding that thing together. You go to flush that out and you put in new, something that's a little Big bit more problem. synthetic. Now you've lost all that ceramic and metallic that may have been in there from the bands or clutches that it's burned. Yep. And then now what you've done is created a huge slippage problem. And how many of you around the world, ladies and gentlemen, are guilty of just getting in the car, putting it in gear because most of today's cars are automatics and driving. When was the last time you took the time to check it? <laughs> okay. Mark's dead on it. So here's Mark's question. Who was a dipstick who stopped making dipsticks for cars? <laughs> So listen, Mark, honestly, I couldn't agree with you anymore. It's crazy, man. When you uh, when you start working with some of these higher end rides, um, you lose all of that stuff. It's insane, man. It's uh, you, you lose your oil dipsticks, you lose your transmission dipsticks. And the only way you check them is literally by starting the car. Most of these things will get up to operating temperature fairly quick. Yep, um, of course, just north of that 200 degree range because the 160 we know is never going to happen. Not gonna happen. Um, so you've got these things that you literally start them up, you let them idle, let them run, let them run. And then 
you shut them off and then you can turn the key back on without starting the motor and you can electronically through the instrument panel or whether it's your nav or whatever the system may be set up as mercedes porsche they're all different uh, you can go through with your menu and you can select engine oil level or transmission fluid level conditions it will tell you exactly what's going on and it will say uh, you know add half a quart, add three quarters of a quart, add a pint. It will tell you exactly what it is that's yep. missing. So it has made it nicer, but for the cars that don't have those features and you do need to add, maybe you need to add in, for example, I talked about mid 2000s Jeeps, maybe your transmission's fluid is low by three quarters of a quart. Well, you gotta figure out why it's low, but maybe it just happened to have a little bit of a leak. You wanna easily top it up before you get into a two, $3,000 repair. You can't do it. You've gotta send it to the dealer. Yep. They've gotta repair why the leak is happening. And then you've literally gotta have them service it through an access hole. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Any other comments here today, Bob? I feel like I'm out, dude, I ran out. I got nothing. <laughs> it's been a long show. Bob, we're talking about making some modifications to our weekly shows and to potentially our podcast. So there's a lot we're working with right now, ladies and gentlemen, we were talking about with a production company who's willing to come in and do some really cool production stuff from a YouTube standpoint. Um, we're looking at that. Um, Bob, do you wanna talk a little bit about that so everybody's kind of understanding what it is we're doing? Cause we have, we were hit and miss last week, really bad. Well, you know, so I, I think what everybody should do is just stay tuned if you guys okay. haven't followed us on all of our social media stuff, please go to our please website do. directly, Bubba's Exotic Motorsports.com, and follow us on whichever platform you're using, whether it is YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they're all out there. We're super active on Instagram and Facebook. Those are linked together. So anything that we do literally here live in the shop does hit you wherever you are in the world, wherever we are, sure. whatever time zone, does not matter. So if you haven't followed us, follow us there, and you'll just see all those updates going on. Everything from product releases to yep. debuts to events to um, you know what's hot in the auto market so just follow us stay tuned and you'll get all the hottest products and so please be flexible with us as we kind of feel our way through these new chartered waters it's been a lot this year 2018 was our move over to the exotics we've been planning it for about three years bub and we finally made the transition um so you know stay tuned with us bub we're, we're, we're trying real hard we, we know everybody loves these shows we love bringing them to you but we have to look at the time uh, availability as well we will not completely leave you hanging nor will we just disappear that's not it at all um, there's a potential to uh, with our podcast platform we're gonna change we might change so we're gonna look at some things but it's gonna be better in the end sometimes growth is hard for example Bob I'd love to have had the guys down there from the production crew with us this weekend catching some interim shots and putting a little episode together because people don't understand what it's like to stand next to those cars man yeah no it's totally different it's it's a totally different and I'm, you know what Bob that's nothing against the American cars or anything like that man no you can still make them look really really good it's just uh, they're two different animals it, it, that's it the you know, it's, it's like looking at a stock Harley versus a, a, a modded chopper or a drag bike. It's you're looking at everything. Everything's different. They're all different there's styles room for all of it. Isn't yeah, there's there? they're all different styles. Everybody's either going to like it or hate it. There are a couple guys down there throwing some hate towards some of the rides. And I basically just told them, shut your freaking I know, mouth. I heard dude. you came out from behind um, the car. Somebody didn't know you were in the trunk area of the B. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, everybody's got their own for. personal taste and style. And, uh, you know, if you don't like it, you don't smash everyone else's projects and their pride and joy. You just Keep moving along. It's just that freaking simple. I get it, man. You know, yeah. talk about what you like. Don't talk about what you hate. It's just That's that right. simple. Move along with it. Go on to the next it's thing. Another whole topic altogether. Yeah, for sure. Charity, right, man? Yeah. So, but I'll tell you what, man. The BEM rides killed it out there. Everybody loved the three-piece the wheel designs. Jesus, man. The oh, Mustang hey. doesn't stop. We're sitting amongst two thousand. Uh, Lamborghinis, Porsches, Ferraris, man, right next to the uh, monster truck, our sponsor. I'm monster. telling you. And, and the whole time, everybody was focused on top of the SEMA Mustang. People don't understand how gorgeous that car is until you're up on it. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty solid, man. It's uh, That thing draws a crowd wherever it freaking goes. It, it does, doesn't man. matter. It draws a crowd wherever it goes. And it doesn't matter if it's parked next to literally a, a $3 million Pugani. It really doesn't matter. People just walk away from that and look at the Mustang. It's, it's crazy. It's funny, too. We had some uh, a couple big car builders from the Miami area who came out to see that car uh, specifically uh, and wanted to know how you did it. He knew the car was going to be there. He wanted to, that was the gentleman I was talking to with the gold New York Yankees uh, chain on. Mm -hmm. uh, he does, he specializes in exotics. He wanted to know how you did it. I can't, I can't give away all the secrets, but he came specifically to see that car. Yep. It's crazy, man. Yep. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So that's it, guys. Keep on watching. Again, go to our website, Bubba's Exotic Motorsports.com. We are doing a crazy sale, Summer 15. That is the it's promo really code cool. all the way through August 31st. Really cool. um, everything on Capristo exhaust is free installs purchased through the 31st of August as well. We have, I think, three or four of those lined up over this week. So stay tuned for some of those before after shots. And let me tell you, that is a flame spitting setup there. Speaking of which, we have the brand new Capristo 458 Spacial exhaust right here. That's it. It's crazy, isn't yep. it? Yep.
I'm out. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to keep on doing it Bubba style. Mark Hoffman, um, I need to know if you're going to plan to be down here for the November 11th Exotics on Los Alas. I'd like to have the whole crew here. Uh, and since you're part of the family and you do the uh, BEM Race Rider Report on the number one rated internationally syndicated motorsports podcast, I'd like you at the tables with us, please. So check the calendar. I know we've been going back and forth on private, uh, privately about all of that. We hope you've learned a little bit about cooling systems, ladies and gentlemen, why they're so important to take care of and do right right there. Let's reach out to touch somebody's life in a very positive manner today, ladies and gentlemen. Let's open the door for somebody whose hands are full. Let's put shoes on somebody's feet who have holes in them. And if somebody's hungry, Sitco, 7-Eleven, right next door. I had somebody walk up to me at the show today, uh, no, Saturday, a couple people actually, and say, you know what? We love your show. It's great to meet you in person. But the best part about it is the way you care about people in general, and you close out each episode. Bob and I both feel very much the same way about humanity and people in general. There's a lot of very negative entitled thinking people in today's society, but there's a lot of good people, ladies and gentlemen. So if somebody's hungry, right next door there is 7-Eleven, Sitco, Sunoco. Go over there, grab them a power bar and a protein drink, right? That's cheaper than your designer cup of coffee, ladies and gentlemen. Until next time, and we'll be posting when the next show is. You might see it tomorrow. You might see it Friday. Definitely see us on Saturday. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, let's keep on doing it Bubba style.